just crazy. And I yeah. finally had a chance to listen to one of your episodes. And I love it. You sound so good. I'm so freaking happy. Really? You, right? Well, I, I just realized that you're you're part of a movement. It was mindful movement with SNES, and now it's going to be mindful eating with Paula. Love it. I love so, it. So I guess we'll kind of just get right into it. This is so fun having you on the show, and I'm directing. I love it. I love it. You look great today. How was work? Awesome. Work was great. Uh, it's so funny because, you know, I'm getting, I'm adjusting to this working from home thing. So I actually, you know, actually had to shower to be with you today. <laughs> I can't wait to kind of dive into your story and how it has evolved over the years. So yes, I thought it would be fun to kind of just go down memory lane to start with you and kind of think back of our early days. I know that I met you through Mark Suber, but right. I was trying to remember as I was preparing for this ap episode, how exactly I met Mark Suber and what that looked like when I first met you. And I'm pretty sure it all came out of Terea Grill because when I was going to college, um, I was, my first restaurant job was in Sanibel Steakhouse and the owner or the GM, I think he was like not the real owner, like maybe financially was sort of the owner. Anyway, he was a Florida State alum, so he connected me with the hospitality, like head of hospitality at Florida State, and they knew the Quakos family. And then I started working for Jimmy and George at the Torreya Grill chain up on the tip of Tallahassee. Um, where was that? Yeah. It was like almost in Georgia. It was. It was up in Thomas near Thomasville. Or it was, I don't even remember, it was kind of out and it was on the north side. Yeah. But now they've yeah. moved, they're on Appalachian Parkway now. Okay, cool. So that we that, that was actually going to be a question later. Is Jimmy still alive? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, he's rocking it. Good and to he's, know. He's, Thank he's God. To... It's back to being called Giorgio's. Okay, cool. I'll have to tell Mark and Kelly that because we're like, is Jimmy still alive? Yeah. But anyway, I believe when I was looking for more jobs, which is also an interesting thing, like how many jobs did I have? <laughs> <laughs> that's when the Quakos family connected me to Mark and then it's like well I already have three jobs why not another one and I think that's how I met you but I also feel like there was a Fort Myers connection that you knew somebody that knew my dad this is really like not ringing a bell okay <laughs> So interesting. Well, I have this whole period of my life. I call it the blackout period, which is kind of funny because it was college at Florida State. <laughs> but I think it was more than that. There's like a lot about my life that like wasn't traumatic. Well, it wasn't like the quote fingers traumatic part of my life that I just like don't remember. So yeah, anyway, that whole circle, I feel like I probably started catering with you or you kind of worked for Mark before you worked for yourself. I did. Correct? So what I do you had... Working? I worked for Mark as his general manager of Karl Marx, which is when we met you and you started doing a little bit of stuff. I almost feel like, did you start babysitting for him or something as well, maybe? I think, okay, you you just connected the dot. So I remember okay. driving to the, to the catering business yeah. and like helping in some way. I think I was just like organizing and you guys didn't really have a big job for me, but he was like, I've got kids. You could be my babysitter. And that was actually my official like job at first was babysitting. And then I right. started catering with you guys. Then you there started catering. Go. And then we closed Karl Marx in December at the end of the busy season in December of 05. And then I opened up the cafe, my cafe in March of 06. And you started working for me at the cafe. I love that So babysat for me as well. Yeah. Oh my gosh. There's so many stories that came out of this period of my life that I share all the time. Like some of my go-to stories and some of my best friends are like, tell them about the time you told the little old lady couple about the special of the day at Paula's Cabana Cafe. You know, I have like so many fun stories of just working in that business. Uh, yeah, I also too. remember helping you get ready and like painting the walls in the Okay, restaurant. so yeah, so we opened March 15th, but from the minute we closed and like at the beginning of the new year for the, you know, two and a half months before we opened, I spent, you know, painting and stuff like that. And that was when Carrie, remember Carrie? 
yeah. Carrie called me and she was like, Hey, put me to work. So the three, I feel like the three of us did some of the prep work and stuff like that. And then we opened and that was when my, and my dad was the host. Remember? Yeah. Pops. <laughs> Good old Pops. Oh my Good God. Old Pops. I, I, in honor of Carrie, I was actually jamming out to Dave Matthews before recording with you. And I'm like, and it, and it just made me laugh because I think towards the end, I used to just annoy the crap out of you. You were like, can you turn this shit off? We've listened to Dave Matthews like, I don't know, 1,000 times. I, I feel like I just was like, can we listen to something else? Just <laughs> something else. Although I love Dave Matthews and went with Carrie to go see him in West Palm a couple of times and had a ball. I know. Oh my God. What a great group. Well, I, I yeah. definitely, um, I think I a couple lessons came out of knowing you and being blessed to be in your circle and it's so cool that I don't know what is this like 15 almost 20 years later um we're here on this podcast together but you've touched my life in a very special way Mm -hmm. I always tell um some of my team members that you gave me the beauty of being friends with your boss but it was like this fine line I always considered you like a friend but I was also scared of as shit of you so it's like <laughs> didn't want to disappoint you because a lot of people in the workplace are always like you can't be friends with your boss and I'm always like I disagree I had a really great example of a healthy relationship with my boss um, but you were more than that you were a mentor you were almost kind of like a mother figure for me you really took care of me so official thank you for helping me um not sure how that college experience would have come out without people like you in my life and then just the beauty of learning I need to say something on that I will tell you because you were always so open to receiving that kind of mentorship I think that is what propelled you to be the person you are today I truly believe that Okay, well, that that's actually like good little tweetable moment from the podcast. You know, you have yeah. to be, if you're calling for something in your life, you have to be able to be open to it. So maybe you in my previous do. comment, when people are like, you can't be friends with your boss, that right there is probably like a negative reaction that they're not even going to have a good relationship with their boss because they already think you can't be friends with your boss. Right. Yeah. When in reality, you know, I think for us, one of the reasons it worked Um, first of all, we were a small little cafe and, you know, I was there every single day and, and all that kind of, and I had, we had a great group of people. We all worked really hard. We all had a lot of fun together. Um, but I think we all all respected each other. You know what I mean? Like I respected you guys, you guys respected me. You knew that I was just as willing to wash dishes as, as, and sweep the floor as you were. And it just all made, you know, it, it was a big circle that really worked. Yeah, no, I love that you just said that comment too, because that was something that I definitely wanted to bring up on this podcast is just never being better or bigger than any job. And I think about those times at your cafe and after big events that we would put on, you know, there's always the cleanup, you know, there's always, um, you know, the sweep in the floor moments, but Those were the moments where if the Dave Matthews was playing loud or we were laughing or maybe it was just a quiet moment. Those were the moments where you could really get into your head and process, um, you know, what was next. And I remember so many times in college, I just like couldn't wait to throw my apron in, you know, like couldn't wait for like my big like fashion job. And then in hindsight, looking back, it was such a gift to be working in that space space and to this day things that I make it's not necessarily at all come hold a candle to how you can cook so we're going to get into that (laughs) but a lot of it is almost like a spawn of what you taught me pastas I make it's like was inspired by pastas that you used to have at the cafe sandwiches paninis all these special touches minted my tea you know these are things that were takeaway from your beautiful restaurant. So I'd love my listeners to hear a little bit about, I guess you could say your resume because it's a really cool story. And I'd love to hear a little bit about your restaurant, just about your catering business. Um, Yeah, shoot, let's go. Okay. Well, as you know, I I went to FSU and I started out at at FSU. Yeah, go no. Um, so started out at, at at FSU, not knowing what on earth I was going to major in started out as a psychology major, and then got a job working at a local restaurant at the time called Barnacle Bills. And so that, 
Yep. Hey, and that I'm I was say- down at Barnacle Bill. Yeah. So that that provided me the kind of mentorship that you and I are talking about now. And I think that uh, the guy that owned it at the time, uh, there were two guys, Jeff and Tim. Jeff, particularly, he ended up owning it by himself. And he was sh- such an amazing mentor, father figure, uh, life coach, sort of teacher for all of us. And and I think that was the the start for me. And it was once I started working there that I went, oh. I'm going to switch my major to hospitality. And FSU, as you know, has a great hospitality program. I was very fortunate that I was able to get in and, and um, you know, get a degree in something that I really enjoyed doing. So then after that, I was approached by Mark. Mark and Carl had just started, uh, they had just bought somebody else's business and it was called Anella's Out the Door, but they were changing it to Carl Marx because they were two brothers and they called it Carl Marx Food for the People. Um, little pun on, <laughs> you know. I don't think I remember that. I probably knew it at the time, but I forgot that. Yeah. Um, and then, so that's when I, I worked for Mark for 10 years as his general manager of the catering company. And, you know, catering is such an amazing, you know, the whole the whole food industry is, is, is an incredible experience for those of us that love it. It is not something that you will ever be able to remove from our souls. You know what I mean? Uh, but f- particularly with catering where for us, we were offsite catering. So we were traveling food to a farm or a barn or someone else's house. The coolest or- location. Pardon? Just the yeah. coolest location. Some very cool places, very cool places. But then you're like, you get there and you're like, oh, this isn't the way it was supposed to be. And uh, there's no running water. And there's a, so you have to really make it work. But I think also being in those kind of environment, like being in that kind of an experience with a group of people together where you're all kind of going, well, what are we going to do about this? And like, well, I found this picture underneath the sink. So why don't we put flowers in this? And, you know, those kinds of things that you you kind of have to do at the spur of the moment and to make to make it run smoothly. And then again, you know, it, there was a reason that you would work with me, right? Because yeah. you're a worker bee. And I could count on you to, I I always said this, I always, for me, I always really liked to hire the kids because they were my kids, hire the kids that were hungry, the kids that, you know, (laughs) I was hungry all the time. Yeah. Yeah. That had to work because you were motivated to really work and you weren't, you didn't, you didn't have extra income. You didn't have extra help. You had to, you had to do it on your own, but in a way that made you from my from my vision that made you a really uh you were always up for taking that extra shift for working that event for for this that and the other so it really i'm digressing but it really makes for a, an overall experience particularly in catering and then you know i worked at Carl marks for 10 years and then closed that down because that is exhausting i mean you know as you know, November through December, you you don't see anybody in your family. You were, you know, it's just, you don't have a real life. Um, you have an amazing work life, but you don't have a real, real life. And it's, you know, sometimes 14, 16 hours days and, and yeah. you know, uh, washing dishes with a garden hose and, you know, and then get, rental dishes, but, you know, and then coming back, you're not even, you don't even get back into town until 1230 at night or something like that. So and then you're up you know, prepping the next day and prepping the next day and, and that kind of thing. And then I opened up the cafe, um, uh, as I mentioned in, in March of 06 and had that from March of 06 until 2010. And then Mark and I then opened up Black Fig, which is a I never gourmet. Got to see. No, you never got to see it. If you ever come to Tallahassee, it's still open and it's doing great. It's a gourmet food shop and catering. So you would walk in and there's pre-prepared meals that are all made from scratch that some are frozen, some are ready to go, some are salads. Plus, you can order and say, hey, I'm having a party for 20 people. I don't need it catered, but I need you all to cook all the food. And here's what I want. And we'd be like, okay, great. Bring us your dishes. And it'll even look like you like you made it. So it cool. was a really, it really was a very good idea. And of course, then through COVID, I'm, I mean, Mark, but then my father passed away and I kind of needed to go a different direction. So Mark, I'm very fortunate with my relationship with Mark. He, he We are still good friends to this day. He bought me out and that was great. And then 
I actually, through one of my catering contacts, um, got the job working for the Department of Agriculture, the Florida Department of Agriculture, their Division of Food, Nutrition, and Wellness. And we were we handled the National School Lunch Program for the state of Florida. And I was the state Amazing. chef for that program. Yeah. And that was also an incredibly cool job because I got to travel throughout the state. I got to work in schools, teaching kids about being good tasters, teaching cafeteria workers who work so incredibly hard, teaching them about handling fresh produce, how to how to get more fresh produce into the schools. We worked a lot with our local Florida farms, which, as you know, we have very many. I mean, Florida is a huge, huge agricultural state. Yeah, I had like a big like whoop, 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 to somebody who was talking smack about Florida. I'm like, you don't you I don't think you guys understand the beauty of Florida. Like yeah. I, I grew up very poor. You know, that's my hunger and drive to work, as you mentioned. Yeah. But we always had great nourishment because of growing up in Florida. I had fresh avocado, oranges, limes, lemons, grapefruit. Like I had, you know, Sweet Florida corn. agriculture just in my, in my neighborhood. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And even now, I mean, in my garden, I, I just sold my house, but in my garden, I had a lemon tree, my lemon tree. I had a, a calamundan tree, which is a kind of a, a cross between a kumquat and a, an orange um, it tastes more like a kumquat and it's like this outer skin is is sweeter than the interior, but you eat the skin and everything. And it's just Florida is incredible. And of course, working in the school systems, you know, our growing season really is uh, September through May, basically our our prime growing yeah. season. So it's really it, it's mirrors our school year. So it was very you know, it was very it was a great way to be able to teach kids about the different types of produce and that kind of stuff. And that was an amazing job, too. And it just you know, I got to do you know, TV shows and and um, lots of TV, lots of TV stuff promoting and then going to visit a lot of our farms. I mean, you know, people I don't think people really understand the, the level of agriculture, the farms that we have in Florida. I mean, over forty seven thousand yeah. farms. Yeah, in Florida, and oh, I think over three hundred commercial uh, uh, products that we produce throughout the year uh, that we send throughout the country, you know. And of course, because of our, you know, similar to California, uh, you have a very, very, you know, temperate climate, so you're able to grow throughout the year. Unlike a lot of our, you know, certainly our mid, mid and northern states. So right. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. So I feel like that's, I didn't realize that there were people like you in the school system doing things like this. Is this a new thing or is this something that would have been going on when I was in school? Cause I, I would say, yes, I was like, sorry to cut you off. That's I right. was like, um, I had like prepaid lunch since we were poor, yeah. but like, it was like some sort of voucher that was different than everybody else's. So I, I was always so embarrassed to use it. So I would choose to not eat at school just so people wouldn't know that I was like the poor kid using the voucher yeah. and I was just like you know thinking about people like you that are in the school system you know helping the cafeteria like be more functional I feel like that didn't exist for me well was like to a point you're right to a point you're right it really depends it really at the time when you were in elementary particular elementary and middle let's say um because once you're in high school you're kind of doing your own thing generally but in but when you were in elementary and middle uh your schools were cooking a lot of stuff but they were cooking a lot more of you know french fries and hamburgers and pizza because there was no real there were no real guidelines it was 2012 that we the healthy hunger free kids act created these sort of the meal pattern that schools had to follow and sort of created this uh sort of extra level of attention to the nutrition that the students were getting from the schools um there has always been the free and reduced lunch program um fortunately for during covid there were waivers that created the, to where everybody got free lunch uh, because it was needed, you know, and I, I would like to hope that that stays because I just think the stigma that you were just talking about is 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 a reason to keep that just, you know, across the board of free yeah. thing. Let's provide good nutrition to us. That's one of my things. Anyway, I think like our focus on our on our on, on what we put into our bodies, the health of our of our children should be like a priority as well as education and the health of our earth. To me, those are like, should be the three, like we should teach our kids. We should be, you teach our kids. Education should be our priority, the health of our earth. And, you know, th those should just be important things that we're focusing on. But 
I'm digressing as well. No, that's well, great. Do. Let's dig into that. Let's take a quick break. I've learned to cut it up a little bit so it's easier to edit. Yeah, you're learning, girl. So I love those three things. And I love that you're, you say it in three, like mind, body, spirit, earth, eating well. So who taught you to eat well? Good question. So I was raised in a household that was my mom and my German grand, well, all three German, but we lived with my German grandparents and my grandmother was literally the house frau. She stayed at home, cleaned the house. She didn't even, never even had a driver's license. She would take her three wheeled tricycle to Publix and get the groceries, but she cooked Probably. every meal. Yeah. We, she cooked every meal and we sat at the dinner table every night. So that is where I learned an appreciation for the dinner table and eating. Um, I can't say necessarily that I was eating a lot of healthy green vegetables and things like that because she was German. So there were a lot of, you know, knock first and, you know, you know, turnips and things like that. But it, uh, but it still inspired um, it inspired me. But then when I started working at Barnacle Bills, at the time, that restaurant, all we did was we served raw, like raw oysters and yeah. steamed. So that's where I kind of really sort of that widened, like I realized how much I loved steamed vegetables <laughs> and, you know, things like that. And it's sort of just, I don't think to me, it's an evolution. My food scenario, even now in my life is still an evolution you know, what, what I eat, what I've learned about my body, what I've learned that my body likes, what, what I've learned my body can handle. I think I recently told you I've, I, I've had high cholesterol. So I've had to really sort of adjust my, my, my eating based on that, even though I love, I mean, there is nothing better to me than a good crispy chicken thigh with the skin on it. You know, I just <laughs> can't eat as much of that anymore. So, I mean, even if I cook it myself, it's still something that I, I mean, I still will eat it, but I'm not going to eat it, you know, like I did because I have to pay attention to what my body needs, you know? So, yeah, yeah there's a couple of things you said there. And when we were connecting before and talking about doing this podcast, you know, manifesting it, you know, it, it was helpful because I don't necessarily know if I have high cholesterol, I'm going to get all my recent checkups going into the new year and, you know, see what's going on. But I think when you mentioned that you were having a vegan diet because of high cholesterol, it kind of just, you know, mindful eating as this topic, it made me, you know, think a little bit more in these last two weeks since I talked to you last about what I was eating. And, you know, like you said, switching it up and listening to my body and making sure that I am eating different foods. Because mm -hmm. sometimes when I'm in good routine or more so in the past, when I would be in a really good like meal prep routine, I would notice that it was like the same foods. Yeah. So there wasn't a variety. And I feel like in anything in life, you need a variety. Listen to your resume and your professional life. It was a variety of diversity. And my workouts are always a diversity. So why wouldn't our food be? Um, so yeah, what are some things that you've been eating to kind of combat high cholesterol? Uh, yeah, exactly. So uh, let me go back to your point of the variety. Because so with the kids, I would always teach them this, the whole thing about eating the rainbow. But when you think about it, I mean, you know, all the different colors of the foods, the produce, particularly all the different colors, you know, if you if you focus on eating all those different colors and trying different things, I, I think, you know, you're, you're doing yourself a favor. Um, for me, you know, I eat so now, like for example, the other night I roasted, um, I roasted some broccoli. I did make some just mashed uh, new potatoes, and I made a, a mushroom soup. Like it was one. I love one your mushroom make. soup. That one I made that, and so the, I used a little bit. I had a cup of soup. Uh, you know, Chip. You know, he. I made him. I don't think I made him ribs or something. Um, <laughs> and so, oh no, I made him venison meatloaf because, and venison's pretty healthy and, you know, has a lot of good benefits to it because it's, you know, wild that he killed. So, yeah, you know, I had so, meatballs on my spaghetti for Christmas Eve. Oh yeah. It's delicious. And it's a lower fat and that kind of stuff. Um, I, you know, I certainly ate a little bite of it because I'm like, Oh, this looks delicious, <laughs> but I don't eat a lot of it. But anyway, kind of use that little mushroom soup as a little bit of gravy on my mashed potatoes and my, you know, so 
but I'll tell you, I do a lot of roasted vegetables. I roast a lot of vegetables. So in the oven. Just throw them in the oven. And easiest way to do it, you want your temperature 400 degrees or a little bit higher, depending on your oven. Lay them flat in a sheet pan, toss them with some some high high temperature oil, avocado, olive, and then a little bit of seasoning and roast them. It depends on the vegetable, 10, 15, 20 minutes, depending. Flip them once if so they get brown all over. And then I use the, like, I will use those vegetables on a salad. I'll use them to make a, a, a white, a, a egg white omelet. I'll use them to, you know what I mean? I, I use them in yeah, a lot of Yeah, all these things I took from you. My family, it's so funny. It's like, my aunt is known for her pumpkin roll. My mom and all her different, like, lasagna type things she makes. And then they're like, Katie, are you going to make your roasted beef? And I'm like, that is a takeaway from Paula's Cabana Cafe. And I'm like, yes. it's kind of funny that I'm known for roasted beef, but it's such an easy thing to do that makes kind of like a more tart vegetable, a little bit harder for people probably to eat a beet. But when they're roasted the way you taught us to make them. Yeah. Mm. Well, so by roasting the vegetables, it actually caramelizes the natural sugars that are found. I mean, you know, all your fruits and vegetables have natural sugars in them. It just caramelizes those. So it adds that extra little layer of flavor and a little sweeter, you know? Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So other foods that you're eating for high cholesterol, you mentioned nuts. So I started buying more nuts in my house. I'm like, yes, why am I not, you know, snacking on nuts? The healthy. I do eat nuts. I've I've been eating a lot more oatmeal for breakfast. I've been eating my, my oatmeal with my black seeds and my fresh berries and my bananas in there. And, you know, I really, what I do most is I try to add more vegetables to everything that I cook. So for example, if I'm making a pasta dish and I'm boiling the pasta, I'll just throw a bunch of vegetables in it in, at the last three or four minutes, you know, carrots, broccoli, um, cauliflower, mushrooms, etc. So instead of eating all the pasta, I'm e- really eating the dish is really just a third of pasta and the other two thirds is the vegetables. Yeah. Oh, that's a good tip. I was going to ask you like a couple easy tips that the listeners could have as takeaways, but I feel like we've talked about some. So roasting the vegetables where it caramelizes, throwing yeah. veggies in last minute, kind of like throwing in a veggies way, into right? Things. And throwing veggies into everything. Like I throw veggies, if I make, for example, like this afternoon, I had a tuna salad sandwich, but I had a friend who gave me some fresh lettuce from our garden, put that on there, put some avocado in there, put some jalapenos in. Um, Uh, And also I've been eating a lot more legumes. So instead of making tuna fish, sometimes I will just make mashed chickpeas. And there are so many, Instagram is amazing with that for that. You can follow these. Pardon? And TikTok. And TikTok. I'm not a TikToker because I'm old. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I and I can't you know, handle like it. too many things. There's too many things. But Instagram, I'm just like, okay, that's easy. I can handle it. And it gives me a lot of great ideas. But lots of cauli- like cauliflower rice. Cauliflower is amazing, you know? And yeah, cauliflower just- is something that my cousin in Jacksonville, another Florida gal, um, is a beautician. And she yeah. got me having blackberry cauliflower in my weekly diet. Just because yeah. they're good for your face. Ah. What else is cauliflower good for? I don't know, but it's... Apparently it heals your skin from the inside out, like blackberries. Oh, great. I eat a lot yeah. of both. Okay, I good. Like That's why I have such great skin. <laughs> <laughs> and I love that your neighbor brought you lettuce for the garden. Again, this is so Florida. I used to grow so much growing up in Florida. I even grew a pineapple once. Yeah, yes. Yes. And I remember also taking care of your garden. I was yes. like, that was you know, part of babysitting. Was, need... Can you water my plants? <laughs> yeah. I wonder if I was actually good at that. Cause I don't remember having like a green thumb, but I grew up in Florida and my grandmother always had plants too. So I must have. But um I always like it's kind of funny because you would understand sometimes when I feel like stuck in a rut um and like unmotivated, I almost just like look at my own life. Do you ever do that? Do you ever like look back at things that you have accomplished to motivate yourself? Because sometimes I'm like, I really did used to do it all. Like, I'm glad that I don't have to be the jack of all trades anymore. But, you know, it's kind of like cool that I had this experience of like working in restaurant, babysitting, 
watering plants. Oh yeah, I went to school and I was pretty good at partying at the same time, which probably yeah, would have been helpful. Sure. <laughs> yes. You know what? Honestly, you knew me back then and I was, uh, you know, I was a single mom. My ex-husband lived in a completely different state. He lived in Arkansas. And so my kids were with me, you know, the majority of the time. And so that was that. And then owning a cafe or managing a catering company and working the different hours. And then also, as you know, I'm an only child. My dad moved to Tallahassee. And yeah, so he, care of him. I was taking care of him once he had Parkinson's. So that was, I truly, the, the, that he, he passed in 2010. And, and, and at the same time, I think, you know, like Nikki had graduated in 08, but those years of the early 2000s, those were the most difficult years of my life. And I am such That's a better when I person. Knew you. Them. Yeah. Maybe and, and, that, it may be full circle. That is kind of why God, I can easily say that now, because I do believe that, you know, he's looking out for us, um, placed you in my life as, you know, you were kind of just like this go-getter achiever, somebody that I needed in my life to kind of keep going. Um, yeah. But, you know, I was probably... I probably understood what you were going through, but not like really understood like how I would look back at it now, you know, right. especially like go, never had kids, but I, I just can't imagine that you had all that going on, but it always felt like you had it going on, you know, that you had everything under control all the well, time. Thank you for saying that. Cause it did not feel like that from here looking out often, but at the same time, at this point, knock on wood, I can say my children are doing great. They're 32 and 28. They're doing amazing. They're grateful. They're thankful. They're appreciative. They tell me that they're like, they know what I did to, 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 you know, for them basically to, 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 you know, and, and they also know I wasn't perfect, but they've forgiven me for that too. And I've apologized for those times too. And, you know, all yeah. the things you do to make you feel like, okay, this is all, this was all really worth it. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So those were some of your hard times. What are some times in your life that you think back that you're the most proud of? That's a really good question. I would say, I would say those times as well. I, I loved having the cafe. I, yeah. I really, that, that was certainly something that made me very proud. Um, I love that it, place. I love that I was a part of that too. Me too. And, you know, it, it was, you know, it's on this, the grounds of this amazing place in Tallahassee called Goodwood Museum and Gardens, which is, is it this still lovely, there. It's still there. It's this lovely in town place. If you're anybody's ever in Tallahassee, please go see it. It yeah. is just a jewel of a place. Um, and it's, it's, it's a historic, uh, it's historic. And we had, and I, you know, had this lovely little cafe in what was called the rough house. Cause back in the day they called it the rough house because that was where, after the parties were over at the main house, they would send everybody down there. And that's where the party would really get going. And that got uh, hey. the rough house. <laughs> but we were kind of honored that I felt like in a lot of ways. Yes. <laughs> we kept that rough house going. Yeah. yeah. So that was really, and just, and, and then even opening up Black Fig, you know, it's still going. And I, I'm sort of delighted I that I got to be a part of that too. You know, I I miss the food industry at this point in my life. But I don't miss, you know, I love having my weekends now and my nights and my time off and not having to manage people and, you know, that kind yeah. of thing. It's just, it's a lot. And it's okay. I feel grateful that I got to do it when I got to do it. I feel like I did it well. I worked hard. And I think at this point now it's, you know, life does go in stages uh -huh. and, even though you change from one stage to the next, like my decision to leave the Department of Agriculture, um, you know, I had been there with at not for nine years, and really, it it was like like I it was like the peak of my career getting to do these amazing things. It was there yeah. were so many feel goods uh, with my daily interactions with the kids and with teachers and with with cafeteria staff, and then even with my coworkers uh, during during a, a, a lot of that time. Um, but it was just, it was time. It was time. Yeah. It was, you know, regimes had changed the department and things had changed. My job had changed. And for me, it was, it was just time. It was like, okay, Paula, you had a great run. It's time to move on to something else. I get that. It's not I easy actually, to do though. Yeah. It's funny because like, I feel like I still have like this whole next chapter I'm working on, like, you know, podcast things, writing a book, 
but I felt that way recently. Obviously, I still work for the same company that I've been working for and the same like, um, but the industry and my day to day has changed. And I remember saying to the team that I was leading and I, you know, was going into this new role where I kind of work individually. I don't necessarily have a team right now. A lot of what I do is just like, I'm kind of my own boss working for a big company. But I just remember saying similar to that to my team, I'm like, you know, like, this is already so good. It doesn't even feel like, like, how could this team even get any better? Like, it almost felt like I was done leading teams in that way. Like, I couldn't, I didn't need to prove it to anyone or most importantly, myself, that I was like a good leader in that way anymore. It was like, I just felt like that chapter was truly closed. I didn't need to be um, walking that walk anymore and walking into a new stage at the same time. It's almost like you really do know. And when you don't, like, and when you try to fight it, I feel like the universe just kind of like when you start to fight what's next, that's when things start to feel uncomfortable in like a bad way. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I completely agree. But I also think uh, going back to what we had said earlier, you've got to be open to the next things. You've got yeah. to be open to receiving these new things that might be coming into your life. So, you know. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. Well, the last question, the last couple questions I have for you is anyone new to cooking that might be listening? We talked about some, you know, simple steps, but what are some food items or ingredients that you would think need to be in someone's kitchen or maybe an appliance that has helped you in yeah. the past? I, you know, I thought about that after we spoke and my number one thing that I would always teach people when I was, especially with the cafeteria staff is having a sharp, good knife. So important. I always say that. <laughs> so important, sharp, good knife, paying attention to, you know, the, to your produce too, like being mindful when you're actually shopping for your produce. I think it's really important. Now we're very fortunate in Florida, like we've discussed the, the, having all this amazing produce in season, but knowing what your season is in your area right? Knowing what your local, like, you know, I mean, yeah, I'm in Florida, so we have a whole lot, but there are many states that have a lot of things that are in season. They might not be all year round, but taking advantage of seasonal produce when it's yeah. in season. Okay. There you go. There we go. All right. Awesome. Well, the last question I had for you, this is a spiritual podcast. So I was thinking about rituals around eating I'm probably going to share um, at the beginning of this episode, the listeners will hear about some crystals that are good. I heard that pink is good in the kitchen. That's why a lot of my house is pink. Um, it's a oh. studio, so everything's open. Um, and like rose quartz, just a loving crystal to have near your food. But is there any ritual that you have around eating or things that you think of around mindful eating? That is such a good question. Hmm. I would say not a ritual necessarily, but I would say things that make me like really um, are my, where I really enjoy eating the most is when it's sitting at a table with friends and we're all dining together and really enjoying our dining experience together. There's a lot to be said for that. And, you know, I think in this world now we have a tendency to sit in front of the TV or just order this and go grab it. And, you know, again, plop in front of the TV or eat in the car or, you know. I think that's a very, very, very important ritual that if anyone listening could stop doing right now, I mean, there were years that I would have like my cereal or my oatmeal in my lap on my way to work. And just yeah. how did that work out for me? You know, yeah. like I wasn't waking up in time. I was stressed out. It's like kind of like a spiral of things. And also just going to dinner and having good conversation is probably a good barometer that you have healthy relationships in your life, that you're spending time with the right people that are good for you. There's just like a million things to unpack with that statement. Marianne, my yoga and instructor yeah I met Marianne that, yep you met Marianne you got to experience her yoga she got to meet and eat your food um but yeah. 
she the, the the very important thing that we learn in yoga school is that yoga is the way you eat so you mentioned that earlier of three things that you could share with the world and you know a, a big piece of doing your yoga is how you're eating um, mindfully and that means how you're showing up and preparing your food with love in the kitchen yes. and you know how you spend the time to enjoy your food and some people like to pray um I think it would be a good thing I always like at yoga school do it I just like am grateful for the food or really take time to look at the plate and really just yes. like lovingly look at it I don't do that yes. on a daily basis but I think when I'm in the kitchen making it even when I'm unmotivated to cook it really does put the pep in your step once you get going it's like a creative element totally I think that's what I've always been drawn to about cooking is the creativity that, you know, and, and even with setting a table, displaying the food on a buffet for catering, all of that, I, you know, I loved all of the creativity that came with it. Yeah. And I think, you know, I mean, even now, just like, just setting a table and putting some candles and, you know, I, I just go out, I mean, I don't get crazy with stuff, but I'll go out and cut some things out of the yard. I mean, you know, again, I'm in Florida, yeah. so magnolia leaves and things, some palm fronds, things that can really make your table just add that pop. And again, it kind of makes you like, Ooh, look at the table. Ooh, we're excited to sit down and eat. We're excited to share this meal together. Yeah, I love that. And I hope that, you know, everyone listening can have some sort of takeaway there because it really can change your evening. It can change your morning. It can yes. start to really change your life by the way you fuel your body and set yourself up for that. So thank you. Thank you for that gift in my life and for being someone that has just always been like a powerful, like girl boss and loving human. And I am glad that everyone got to meet you today. Oh, thank you, Katie. I'm glad I got to be here. I love you, man. I love you. And I'm so proud of you. And thank you for having me. Of course. I'll talk to you soon. All right. Love you. Bye. Love you. Bye.